So I'm a psychologist here at the University of York, and my name's Alex Wade, and I'm going to be telling you about uh, some work that we've been doing recently on um, video games and the cognition of video games. So as a psychologist, people often ask me, can you see this? It's a bit washed out. The question they often have for me is, Alex, will watching things like this make my child a horrible person? And so this is, uh, this is Kota Khan delivering a finishing move on Cassie Cage here. And uh, this is a, you can't really see, but there's a nasty knife going through her throat. And they want to know if their children, playing these games day in, day out, will become desensitized to violence and um, should they stop them. And I don't know the answer. That's not what I do. And uh, I have no opinion on this, although the British tabloid newspapers definitely do. Uh, so the Daily Mail wants to ban these evil games, and the Daily Mirror has opinions as well. This is, anyway. And uh, so that's not what I do. I'm not going to tell you anything about how video games affect people's cognition, affect their personality, because I don't know. What I do know about, or what we're starting to research, is the other side of this loop. So can we tell anything about your personality from the way that you play video games? All the data I'm going to show you today comes from a single video game, League of Legends. Let's just have a quick show of hands. How many people here? This is going to be a League of Legends rich audience. How, everyone put their hand up if you have ever heard of League of Legends. It's like everyone. Great. So um, League of Legends is made by Riot Games in Santa Monica. Riot Games have very generously shared some of the data from League of Legends with us. Quite a bit of data, in fact. Um, almost a million games from League of Legends or a million data points from League of Legends. And we've set to work asking what we can learn about people's personality across the globe from those data sets, from those League of Legends data sets. So in the interest of full disclosure, I should say that there are other types of this type of game. This is something called a MOBA, a multiplayer online battle arena game. And I'll talk a bit more about what it is in a minute, but there are several versions of this game made by different companies at the moment. They all share a common theme, and you'll see some <coughs> examples of gameplay coming through in a minute. So why are these games special? We think as psychologists, these games are somewhat special. One thing that's special about them is they just have millions and millions of players. So over 100 million active players just for League of Legends alone, and probably many more than that for all the other ones put together. Across the entire planet, and for League of Legends, that's about 7 million active games at any moment, day or night across the planet, people are playing this game. All the data from those games get logged onto servers, and then Riot Games are able to access those data from those servers and tell us things about the game. The games are commercial. Um, they make their money from events and various in-game purchases. But for example, this is an international um, League of Legends competition that they're playing here. And this is a big auditorium full of people. It's being professionally um, uh, narrated here at the front. Here are the players playing in their little booths. And then it's being streamed across the internet. And thousands of people are watching it. They've all paid lots of money to be in this auditorium. So there's a lot of money in this as well, and a professional level interest. The prize pools in these types of games are millions of pounds at this point, and you get professional athlete visas to go to different countries if you're one of these professional game players. So I could describe the game very, very simply. Um, two teams of five people start at opposite corners of a map, and they fight their way across the map, and they gain territory, and they win um, sort of objectives. And then eventually, one or the other teams captures the other person's base. And I just can't really, there's no words that can, can do this justice. It's interesting to us from a psychological point of view because so much of this game is complex. It's complex in terms of its tactics, its strategy, its requirement for rapid decision making. And for those of us brought Most up on... this fight is decided within the first... ...games which... <laughs> so although these emphasize hand-eye coordination, they're just a different class of game. So I'm going to show you in a second about three seconds of League of Legends. And it's been three seconds of team fight. And then the complexity of that team fight has been broken down into about a minute of, um, of um, explanation. And I think I'm going to show you this just to give you a sense of how complex three seconds of this game can be. So here's Most professional of commentary. Most decided within the first couple of seconds. So we're going to slow it down and watch it from a few different perspectives. First off, both casting and reacting to Realm Warp requires extremely quick decision making. While Jensen's channeling the ability, SKT can see the location where C9 will teleport to. However, it's not until C9 are actually teleporting that SKT knows how many people are arriving. Once the animation shows that three opponents will be teleporting directly on top of Faker's Victor, 
all of SKT must react. Faker's the first to answer, and he places his gravity field perfectly. Instead of placing it in the middle of the realm warp location, he places it in between the location of the three teleporting C9 players. Then, knowing time is limited, he casts his Chaos Storm. Unfortunately for Faker, that's all he has time to do, because C9 arrive and obliterate him. Impact's cannon channel slicing Maelstrom, and Smoothie's Alistair makes sure Faker isn't going anywhere with the Pulverize. Get all that. So <laughs> normally I give this and there's blank faces all around, but you guys are all like, oh, that's really cool, that's really interesting. They're all gamers. So you can see that this game resembles Space Invaders in much the same way that chess resembles tic-tac-toe. There's a lot going on here. There's rapid decision-making, there are tactics, there's strategy, there's people with excellent hand-eye coordination, millisecond reaction speed, but lots of other stuff in their head at the same time. When, we, when I started to get interested in this game, it became apparent that this was going to provide a rich enough environment to start asking questions about personality. So simple games, you can't learn anything about people's personality from looking at Space Invaders. But maybe you can learn about people's personality from this rich in-game environment. So before we move on, I'm just going to draw your attention to two aspects of this game that you might have missed. The first is that obviously people are playing in a team. So all these blue lines here represent one team of players and all these red lines are another team of players. And then notice that each one of these players has given themselves a name. So they sat at some point in their bedroom or thoughtfully in their living room and they thought, what would I like to be known as in the online world? And this person has chosen Bang and Blank and Faker and Wolf and nice names, simple names. And one of the things that we thought, one of the sort of the, the leverages that we might be able to gain into this question about whether games affect personality, uh, whether personality affects games, was maybe the names that people give themselves in the games reflect the way they play within the game. And let me explain what I mean by that. These are nice names. Some names are not nice names. So the faint of heart should look away now. Here are some of examples of toxic names that people, about one in a hundred players, will give themselves in the in-game environment. These are the nice ones that we could find, so we had to filter them. There are no, m many of these contain racial epithets or jokes about the Holocaust, they're really horrible things, and, and my son plays these games, and I would be frankly disappointed if I came home one day and discovered that he had called himself, for example, or any one of these, really. Um, <laughs> what sort of, we, so we saw these names coming up, and we talked to Riot, and they said, we have a suspicion that the people who call themselves these toxic names behave badly within the game environment, and this, this is a sort of a trope among game players. They see these people coming into their match, and they, their heart sinks, and they think, this person is going to be a dick in the game. And Riot asked us, could you, could you have a look? Could you see if that is true? Do people who choose toxic names essentially in the real world, so people can see them, they're antisocial, do they also behave in an antisocial way within the game? So we're directly checking this hypothesis that toxic names chosen outside the game relate to bad behavior within the game. We're able to assess bad behavior within the game because at the end of every game of League of Legends, and many of these MOBAs in fact, there's an opportunity to sort of gossip about your co-teammates and report on them, um, that is to say they were behaving badly, they were, for example, feeding the enemy team with wins, or they were using racial slurs or whatever in the game. But you can also say nice things about them. You can say they were helpful, they were good teammates, they were friendly. The helpful, nice things are called honors, and the bad, nasty things are called reports. And so the obvious hypothesis is that people, if you look upon hundreds of thousands of names, people with toxic names are gonna get more of those reports and fewer of the honors. And, more importantly, they may also send out fewer honors. They may behave less nicely to other players after the game, and they may send out more negative stuff to people after the game as well. And sure enough, when we looked at it, that's exactly what we found. So these red lines represent the toxic players compared to the controls. They're sending out less honor, so they're, being ni not, they're not being as nice to other players. They're certainly receiving less honor, so no one's praising them after the game. And the opposite is true for the reports, so they're gaining significantly more negative reports and sending more negative reports as well. So it works both ways. They're not just being um, ganged up on by the other players, they're kind of being nasty to the other players even after the game as well. And in the sort of the language of science, we said in the paper, players with toxic names have a lower interaction valence. They, behave, they receive more bad reports, fewer honors, and they behave more negatively in the reports and praise that they send. So it's true. If you see someone in this game with one of these horrible names, they're very likely to behave like a bad player inside the game as well. So we have this suspicion, this, this one tiny piece of evidence that maybe people's personalities in real life do affect the way they play in the game. Where could we go with this? 
So one place we could go is in to other aspects of personality. So for example, impulsivity. Here's a child who's staring at a marshmallow. And what this child has been told is that if he waits for long enough by staring at the marshmallow and doesn't eat it, he can have more marshmallows in the future. Children who are unable to do this, children who are left to learn in the room and just gobble up the marshmallow, sometimes run into problems later in life. It's thought that they're unable to um, discount immediate gratification to get bigger future rewards. So here's one place you could go in a game environment. You could look at these events which happen throughout League of Legends all the time where you give them an opportunity to benefit yourself immediately now or wait and benefit the team or yourself more later. Some players may be unable to do this. But for now, we went for a slightly different direction. We went to look at IQ and cognition. So if I told you that a child was waking up maybe early in the morning and playing three hours of video games every day before he went to school, you might think that was a bad thing for that child to be doing and maybe he should be getting on with his German homework, son. But instead, if I told you that he was waking up and playing three hours of chess every day, you'd be kind of impressed because we think that chess is linked in some way to IQ and that people who play chess are brainy. And so one of the things, when we started to think about this more and more, we thought, well, these games are as complex in some way as chess, maybe more demanding cognitively than chess because they depend on this rapid decision making. What if there's a link between IQ and the eventual level that you would achieve in these games? And so you can, you can check IQ using one of these um, rather simple paper and pencil tests that maybe many of you will already have done. We choose this very standardized test called the WASI 2. We brought in loads and loads and loads of League of Legends players. We sat them down in a room and we made them do this test. And then we recorded their results. And we actually got them to do some other tests as well to look at things like autism. And, but IQ was the main one. And then we just looked at their rank in League of Legends. And this was their stable rank. These were not um, beginner players. These are players who'd played for long enough that they'd achieved some sort of stable level in the game. And the suggestion was, the hypothesis was, that the level they finally achieved in the game was going to be correlated with their IQ in some way. And we found exactly that. Oops. We found exactly that. So in the world of psychology, this was a fairly high correlation. We think about 20 to 30% of the variance in people's final ability to play these types of games is related to their IQ, is correlated to their IQ, is explained by it. And so broadly, the smarter you are, the higher rank you'll achieve in these games. Or another way of looking at it is, if you know someone's final rank in League of Legends, you can have a guess at what their IQ is. So here's the, here's the global TED idea. These games are global. They're played across the planet, night and day, all the time. What we think is happening is that these games are like IQ tests, or they're like personality tests. Every time someone plays one of these games, it's like they're taking a single IQ test. And there are millions and millions and millions of these games being played all the time in every city and every part of the world. So what if, as a games company, I can zoom in on some region and just start logging the performance in these games day and night, on and on and on. So imagine every one of these points of light across Europe are a game player, and we're just tracking them all the time. And then what if, as a games company, or as a psychologist who has access to these data, we notice that one place starts to go down in their performance, maybe even just a tiny bit. We might then be able to go to that location and ask if something's happened. Maybe there's an outbreak of flu there. Maybe there's been a release of some sort of toxic chemical into the environment. And if you think that's unlikely, uh, this happened quite recently in Flint, Michigan. Lead was released into the water supply, and the effect of con on the cognition of the local population is still unknown. So the idea is that games could provide us with a way of monitoring the health of the entire planet, the mental health of the entire planet, or the cognitive performance of the entire planet. And ultimately, I think what's might be true is that although we don't know enough about video games to say whether playing video games affects cognition, the idea that cognition could affect the way that we play video games might be of global importance. Thank you.